Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Aisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz, Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello, and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. On this week's episode, we've put together the drummers from two of the UK's biggest bands in recent memory, Dave Roundtree and Philip Selway. Now, Roundtree came to fame with Blur, one of the original Britpop bands of the early 1990s, and I probably don't need to give you much biography on that band. But in their long hiatuses, Roundtree has lived about a dozen other lives. He's been an amateur pilot, a professional lawyer, an elected politician, and a social activist, among other things. On the music front, he found yet another career creating soundtracks for TV and film, starting with the Bros, or as we say in America, Bros, documentary After the Screaming Stops. Now, Blur is back together for some massive shows in 2023, but during the pandemic, Roundtree got together, virtually of course, with producer Leo Abrahams to make his proper solo debut. Freed from the constraints of both his bandmates in Blur and showrunners, Roundtree did his own thing, and the result is Radio Songs, a delightful 10-song album that flirts with Britpop here and there, but flirts with other interesting sounds as well. Here's a little bit of London Bridge. Now, Philip Selway is best known as the drummer for another huge British band, Radiohead, with whom he's been making music since 1985. Though he always had the itch to write his own songs, it wasn't until 2010 that Selway actually took the leap and released his first solo album, The Gentle Familial. In between Radiohead duties, he's found the time to release another one, the more sonically expansive Weather House from 2014, and work on some soundtracks as well. Selway is now gearing up for the release of his third and most ambitious album yet. Strange Dance comes out toward the end of February, and it features a bunch of Selway's musical friends on a very cinematic yet personal sounding set of songs. You can pre-order various formats from your favorite retailer. In the meantime, check out a bit of the song Check for Signs of Life right here. Coming back again to what I know is not the same It feels all out of place In this conversation, these two drummers sound immediately chummy, though they were only passing acquaintances beforehand. They talk about stepping away from bigger bands to do your own thing, including the process of finding your own voice. What if it's rubbish? Laughs Roundtree at the top of the chat, proving that even the biggest stars can have doubts. Enjoy. So, Dave. Yes. Have you been rehearsing today? Not rehearsing, no. Not rehearsing. No. No, no, okay. <laughs> trip to if you get my, okay. If you get my drift. <laughs> I get your drift. Oh. But I have been listening to radio songs. It was shared with me a, a while ago. And oh, I'm cool. Very much enjoying it. So great work. Thank you. It almost never happened. I don't know if you feel the same, but it always seemed like there was only downsides and not upsides to taking that kind of artistic risk yeah you know it's kind of uh, lying awake at night at 4 a.m thinking what if i do that and it's rubbish people will point at me in the street and laugh but if, it, <laughs> if i do it and it's good people will go well it's in blur yeah all of those thoughts evaporate in the daytime but uh, in the nighttime 4 a.m lying awake full of anxiety and uh, trepidation it's like oh but oh god what if, you, what if it's rubbish? <laughs> what if nobody's interested? What if it's, oh, what if you can't do it? What if this, what if that? Are you a 4am anxious person too? I can be, yeah. And it is a tricky time as well. I mean, I <laughs> never have any problems getting off to sleep. No. You know, but the danger comes at about three or four o'clock in the morning because yeah. you wake up, your mind's a little bit rested. It's been able to kind of churn all these things over, 
whilst you've been asleep and it's just all there kind of loud and clear in your head and you can't I think it's just that kind of brain pattern that you get into something something to do with that sleep pattern is just that everything just seems to be so much more vivid I find a need to talk myself down at that point <laughs> so what was the tipping point for you then if kind of all of these voices were all, all these kind of anxieties were there first off there was sort of my film composing career mm which I kind of only ever really fell into by accident. My uh, partner is a, a music supervisor. Right. And so she would get me to do, you know, these projects that ran out of money and uh, needed some cues yesterday. She would always palm those off on me. <laughs> That's love for you. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do a film overnight once. It was a half hour film for BBC and they cleared all the, the score. They bought the score only for UK only. And they had only realised <laughs> that the night before it was due to be broadcast wherever else they'd sold it to. So how many cues? It was a short, so it was about eight cues or something like that. Overnight, that's a lot. I had something to aim for because I had the original score, you know, so uh, right. it was a bit easier than starting from scratch. But, uh, yeah, so I ended up with a showreel kind of almost by accident, really. And there it would I would have carried on bumbling along with it had it not been for the Bross film. Right. Which, uh, I, you know, the after the screaming stops, the film about Bross and their reunion. Oh, yes. I don't know if that's something you've ever seen. I did that. And it was a it was a really oh. interesting project. I've worked with the director Joe Perlman before, and he he inherited this job from another director. And he rang me and he said, "You come down immediately. You have to see this." And it was a film about this eighties band Bros. I don't know if you remember them. I certainly do. And uh, two brothers, two brothers who they had the meteoric rise to fame, were briefly like the most famous people in the world, really, mm. and then equally meteoric fall back down to earth. Yeah. And the the brothers had fell out so badly they hadn't spoken to each other since okay. for decades. And then all of a sudden, somebody persuaded them to do a reunion tour and somebody else persuaded them to allow the rehearsals and everything to be filmed. And so they literally got off the plane, went to meet each other and said hello to each other for the first time in God knows how long, 30 years or something. The first, first time they'd spoken in 30 years. And for about 10 minutes... They're the best of friends, you know. Oh, it's so great yeah. to see you. Oh, it's so great. And of course, then they go into rehearsals and uh, the whole thing falls to bits and all of the old bitterness comes to the fore. It's actually a really lovely film that exposes their vulnerabilities. They're actually incredibly funny people, both uh, intentionally and unintentionally funny people. Without too many spoilers for me, does it end up in a happy place? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, they do finally manage to get it together to put on this show. The show is good. But anyway, we made this film. I did the score for that with a friend of mine and it got broadcast f sort of without that much notice, really. And then a, a year or so later, it was broadcast in a really good slot at Christmas, mm. one of those slots that everybody's watching the TV on. So a year after its initial release, suddenly it became the kind of water cooler film after Christmas that everybody was talking about. It won loads of awards and that kind of launched my my uh, film music career, really. I've been doing that for about seven years, seven or eight years now. So that's the first inciting incident. It's all of that, making music. And you know, you know, you do it too. You know just how much music you have to write and how intense it is. I ended up yeah. with with a lot of confidence in my musical abilities and a recording studio full of equipment to make it with. So I had the kind of opportunity, the means and the opportunity. But then uh, along, I probably still wouldn't have done it, except that along came COVID and lockdowns. And uh, yeah. by the time of the second lockdown, the film work had uh, had died the death the film industry had died and I was just sat in this lovely studio looking around going what should I do now yeah <laughs> and Leo the producer and I had resolved to work on something at some point and uh, is that Leo Abrahams Le Leo Abrahams yes ah oh. he's amazing absolutely amazing and so we decided to give that a go and it was locked down we couldn't work together so we thought it probably wasn't going to work but actually turned out to be a ruthlessly efficient way of working, both in our separate studios, swapping files backwards and forwards, collaborating over Zoom. Yeah. And uh, it was, the whole thing was done in six weeks, really. 
What about you? What was your inciting incident? I mean, you didn't leave it quite as late as me, did you? You've been doing it 10 years now. Yeah. When I first started getting into music, kind of the the drumming and the songwriting started at the same time. But when we when we got signed, which was back in 1991, I suddenly kind of actually leaped to thinking, OK, oh, my word, I've got to be like a proper drummer now proper musician and it seemed like quite an uphill struggle really so I, I really just focused on my drumming for a while and then gradually the the kind of the songwriting came back through it's kind of what I do to in my downtime time really and and just to remind myself that kind of yeah I do have a musical voice beyond that context beyond the drumming and everything and I got to to a point where I'd um accumulated enough material thinking, well, what do we do now? And then you kind of launch yourself into it. I didn't have complete lyrics at that point. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to sing it at at all. And so you you enter this whole other process of trying to find a singing voice of thinking, have I got anything to say in songs? And kind of say it convincingly. Um, But gradually, you know, it all started to come together. I did a really great project actually down in New Zealand, which was the end of 2008 and 2009. And it was working with Neil Finn, Crowded House and yeah, yeah. Ends. And Neil had brought together loads of musicians. So it was like Will Cover, Katie Tunstall, loads of people and Johnny Marr, all congregating down at his studio in Auckland, which is an amazing, amazing studio. And he's a, a lovely man. His, his, his family are lovely and it's all so welcoming. We went down there to write and record an album and then play shows for it. And that, it was all to be done in like two and a half weeks. So I'd gone down as a drummer and then I started playing some of my songs just around the studio. And everybody said to me, well, maybe you should record one, which I did. And so with these incredible musicians around me, playing my material it was just it was just one of those moments thinking okay maybe I can do this <laughs> and it grew from there really and it's wonderful actually because as you said I've been doing it for for just over a decade now and it kind of takes you off into these wonderful musical collaborations which you never expected and then you just build on that don't you really Did you have a formal background in, um, in in music at all, a formal education in it? Yes. I was going to be an orchestral percussionist. Oh, yeah. That was my first idea, really, because both my parents were classical musicians. Okay. And so when I t- took an interest in playing the drums, I mean, I was only playing the drums, really. I thought it would annoy them because they tried to make me learn the piano. I thought if I if I if I could learn another instrument, I'll pick the most annoying instrument known to man, and then they won't make me have musical instrument lessons anymore, and then I can go out and play football with my mates. So my first instrument was the bagpipes, which is a well known as being oh, wow. the most annoying instrument known to man. But uh, though I've come to revise that opinion, I've come to quite like the bagpipes. But I thought the, the second most annoying instrument is the drums, and I was about ten years old, you we nine or ten, and they. But I just got utterly obsessed from the word go with the drums. Really, it was playing percussion and orchestra that I I absolutely loved because it's the best seat in the house, really, The where the percussionist sits. You're sort of right in the heart of the orchestra next to the basses. So you've got all of that visceral sound. You know, it's like being a member of the audience as well because you don't really have to do very much. You know, you count up <laughs> to 300 and you whack something and you count up to 200 and you clash something, you know. Do you get the anxiety 10 bars before you, you're supposed to clash the cymbals thinking, <laughs> oh, no, I can't miss my cue. <laughs> I actually did do one classical gig when I was about 13 or 14. I got called up by a conductor and their dro- their percussionist had dropped out at the last minute. We were playing Handel's Messiah. Why did, I'd never Ooh. played Handel's Messiah. I hadn't really listened to it. I didn't know much about the repertoire. I was far more interested in playing than listening. So I said, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I turned up and... I had a sheet of paper and on it it said numbers 1 to 26 tacit. Obviously it means you don't play anything. I said, what do you mean numbers 1 to 26? I looked over the bases and they had a book. 
a book of music and I had one piece of paper and it's hard enough <laughs> counting to 326 yeah. you know to make sure you go bang in the right place imagine counting 14 pieces and then counting up to 326 I thought there's no way I'm ever going to do this so I leaned over to the bass player and I said could you just give me a nudge when we get to piece 14 of course he <laughs> forgot to do that so uh, the, in Handel's time, the timpani parts were, were improvised. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll do what Handel would have wanted. I'll improvise the timpani <laughs> part. <laughs> and I'll never forget the Brilliant. look on the conductor's face when I, uh, when I started my improvisation. Um, and that was the first and last time, my first and last classical gig. Oh, wow. I had a similar experience. I played in the school orchestra a couple of times. And I mean, bless our head of music. He was so encouraging and so indulgent that it was a similar thing. I mean, my sight reading is shocking. And so I just, <laughs> I was playing the snare drum and, and, and he, would, he would just let me get on with it. <laughs> just make it up as I was going along. No, I was the same. So by that time, I was starting to discover pop music and girls and all of that anyway. And so yeah, really, I mean, I... I still have a, a real passion for for kind of uh, sitting in the middle of, a, of a, a load of players. You know, there's nothing better or a load of singers or something. You know, I love choirs. I love orchestras. I love brass bands. There's something about the, the similar, lots of iterations of a similar tone somehow, yeah. you know. The, it, it sort of resonates in a way that uh, lots of different instruments don't. You know, lots of brass band instruments, at least, are all the same shape. They're all these kind of oval-shaped instruments. So they all have the same overtones. If they're all in tune with each other, it builds something much greater than the sum of its parts. But, uh, yeah, then I, just, I discovered being in a band by that point anyway. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a moot point. So when you're doing your soundtrack scores, yeah. do you write for ensembles or do you are you kind of there with the Spitfire library of samples? Yeah, I use Spitfire. It's the kind of industry standard string samples now. Yeah. So I've got a couple of Spitfire orchestral libraries. But I do, if possible, and certainly on the last big show that I, well, one of the last big shows, The Capture, we wrote basically a sort of kit of parts for orchestra. So with all the main themes and then some sort of interesting colours and uh, yeah. bits and bobs. Because we only... The, even though these shows are absolutely huge and cost millions of pounds, by the time it comes to do the uh, soundtrack, you discover that they've spent all the money on flashy cameras and expensive actors. And so <laughs> the, the conversation always goes, do you want to do this brilliant high-profile series? Yeah, yeah, brilliant. We haven't got any money. Oh, OK. <laughs> oh, all right. All right, then. Oh. <laughs> I'll put my fee into the recording session, then. Yeah. <laughs> I always try and find a way of shoehorning an actual orchestra in because the difference between the samples, which are great, I mean, an yeah. age away from where they used to be even 10 years ago, but between that and some actual players playing it is just quite breathtaking, quite astonishing. Yeah. What about you? Do you write for ensembles as well? I do. When I've done the soundtrack work, like you, I really feel that, that you kind of, the, the experience of listening to it and of having that kind of, uncertainty of where it might go with I mean even though you know incredible musicians who can 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 play things perfectly but still there's always that extra human element in there of, of responding to each other in the moment so yes I like to work uh right for with ensembles in mind and then uh, for for kind of more complicated stuff. I've, I've worked with a, a string arranger called Laura Moody, who's amazing. She's been part of the uh, Elysian Collective for quite some time and brings in amazing players. I haven't got as much experience in doing soundtrack work as you have and kind of I feel, you know, uh, an absolute novice, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> but for the work that I, I have done in it, I've, I've just found it so kind of, so engaging. You lose yourself. It's so lovely to actually have something to respond to. You have all those performances. You have the production design to respond to. When you're writing a song, you know, you have that thing of, okay, 
so what are I going to write about? And so it comes from you. But to actually, actually have have that uh, material there in the first place, yeah, I, I love responding to that and and losing myself in that process. There is that bit, though, that is quite anxiety-inducing, that everybody else has done their bit, and it's just like, <laughs> waiting for you to do yours. <laughs> Which is the opposite feeling that drummers normally have, isn't it? I mean, you know... We normally put our parts down first and then kind of sit back, put our feet up and wait for everybody else to get on with it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not sure that feeling of feeling like a novice in the in the film world ever goes, I think, because it's such a it's such a bizarre thing to do. Mm. You know, three things are dramatically different, aren't they? The experience of a being in a band, B being a solo artist and C being a film composer. They're entirely different skills, even though you may be playing the same instruments. The music side of it may be as similar or as dissimilar, depending entirely on the project. But the actual experience of doing those three things are about as different as jobs you can get in the music industry. Yeah, absolutely. Do you feel that it's, it is part of, of how you've developed as a musician? Do you, you, could you have placed yourself doing, having that, being able to cover that kind of spectrum? So going back, I don't know, to, to the 90s or something like that? No, not really. To be honest, I've never been over-blessed with confidence. It's probably why I'm a drummer. been a drummer all these years <laughs> rather than a front man. But being a, being a film composer, like, it's quite a jolt. I don't know if you found it when you go from it being right when it's right to it being mm. right when somebody else says it's right. Yes, absolutely. And I know many artists never successfully negotiate that kind of br bruising of their ego. Yeah. So, so maybe if uh, if the ego is too big to start with, it's kind of, uh, it's terminal. I often find that kind of constraints, it's the constraints in what you're having to do often that are the most creative things because the, the constraints put problems up and once you're problem solving, that gets you out of that, oh my God, what am I going to do state that you were talking about? You know, what am I going to write about? Yeah. Like that blank page thing is the most yeah. terrifying. If you, you know, to, yeah. that being the solo artist is the ultimate blank page, isn't it? You know, I've my first yeah. album's out. Now I'm thinking about album number two and I'm going... Well, hang on, I've just used up all my ideas in album one. <laughs> what if I don't get any other ideas? What on earth is this next album going to be about? It could be about anything. I can have any instruments I want. I can write in whatever form I want, you know, which it should be liberating. But in fact, it's absolutely terrifying. But to, yeah. in the film world, you've got to hit the beats of the scene. You've got to work mm. within the kind of instrumentation that you've agreed with the director or the producer or the showrunner even if you think you've written the best piece of music that's ever been written for any film in history you're not the ultimate arbiter of that somebody else is and if it ain't yeah. right they'll tell you to do it again and if it ain't right 20 times you'll be doing it a 21st time you know it's yeah. kind of and then being in a band is different again it's a it's a a successful band anyway you have a brand you have an image you have people kind of uh, looking on to, to uh, you know, surrounded by a, a team, a large team in many cases, especially when you're on tour, everything's geared towards the show. You know, in, in, in a way, musicians start to get infantilised by that, don't they? Because whatever happens... Oh, absolutely. 50,000 people have bought a ticket. You're going on stage at nine o'clock. I don't care what happens. You're going to be on stage at nine o'clock, you know, so... Mm. It's a, a very, very different experience again. I think that's a very good way of describing it as, of, as becoming infantilised because actually you can go into this bubble where you, you don't really need to make any decisions. Uh, everything is done for you. Um, yeah. And that's actually a really unhealthy place to be. It's kind of fun for a, for a short <laughs> time, but... <laughs> but it, it kind of stunts your development as well. And I think you kind of have to keep that very much in mind, don't you? You have to kind of pull yourself out of that, that state. I'm not sure I did pull myself out of that state. I think I was, I was quite comfortable there. But the, the, the bands kind of collapsed a bit. And, it, you know, I found myself spat out of the machine back into the real world, you know, where suddenly there weren't people there 
picking up yeah. the pieces and paying my bills and you know making sure I was okay. And that was quite a, that was quite a jolt, really. I found that quite you've a difficult transition. You've used that time well, though, uh, haven't you? <laughs> well, I've I kept mean, you're, busy. You're absolute renaissance man, aren't you, really? <laughs> well, it's a renaissance idiot. I do lots of things, <laughs> but I'm not, promised, I'm not saying I'm very good at any of them, but I do do lots of things. It's absolutely true. <laughs> but part of that is, you know, I my hobby used to be drinking. And when I, right. when I gave up that hobby... Uh, I found that there were all these hours in the day and I found I really regretted all the wasted time. I felt like I'd been given this sort of wonderful opportunity to 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 kind of, you know, tackle the world head on and make of it all I wanted. And I'd kind of squandered that for 20 years, you know, and it felt that time was quite precious. And, uh, you know, so I just kind of threw myself into all kinds of things. I became the kind of person that just said yes for, you know, yes first and ask questions later. And I found yeah. that that's taken me down some rabbit holes, but also it's taken me to some really interesting places. You must have had to become kind of like laser sharp um, levels of organisation. If you only, know? if only. No? <laughs> that, that was... <laughs> No, I'm still I'm still fairly last minute dot com. What's the most urgent thing? I firefight like a <laughs> like a crazy man. I know what I need is a is a is a PA with the laser sharp levels of organisation. That's why I've been dragged and screaming to the conclusion that oh. uh, that uh, after fifty eight years, it just ain't gonna happen. You know, and I'm gonna have to buy that skill rather than develop it. <laughs> so, what are you working on now? So at the moment, I'm just um, building up to uh, release an album at at the end of February. Um, So it's going to be my third solo, actual song-based solo album. I have contrived through a mutual friend to have a sneak peek of that, and it's very good. So well done. Thank you very much. Yeah, so coming up to... um, start some shows next week so it's uh independent venue week next week and um so i'm out doing five shows i've been invited to be uh an ambassador for, for them this year um so the show's a part of that so yes been busy rehearsing and getting ready for the other kind of live stuff that's coming up and um starting kind of that as as you've described that that kind of round of of interviews, of talking about the record, which is, you know, very grateful that people want to talk about it. That's <laughs> very welcome. And it feels good to actually start be, be coming to the point where the record will be released because um, I finished it about uh, a year ago and um, and it kind of in the current climate with, um, you know, very full schedules and that backlog of of uh, vinyl, <laughs> actually trying to get your vinyl printed, kind of takes ridiculous amounts of time now, doesn't it? It's like nine months lead time on it in, in some instances. And so that's been an adjustment because normally, you know, I think we've been brought up on that, that cycle of deliver a record and then three months later it will be released. But with that as well, it's given me time to kind of really develop some ideas working up to this and prepare properly for it and uh, you know working with people on the videos kind of developing ideas around that and um yeah it's been kind of nice having the the breathing space in there as well yeah i know what you mean about the vinyl thing and that scuppered me as well my album was ready for probably well probably 18 months realistically well certainly a year but uh and, you know, I, that was the first I'd heard of these uh, vinyl delays was when I went, right, when can we get this out? And, yes. Uh, you know, I was bro- the bad news was broken that it was going to be at least nine months delay. And nine months meant it was going to be, you know, if the earliest we could release it was Christmas. So pointless doing that. So we're going to have to wait till at least January. And I thought, well, there's good, good size and bad, you know, silver lining and everything. I think that's at least going to give me you know, nine, 10, 11 months to get all my ducks in a row. You know, I can get yeah. all my videos shot. I can do all of this kind of stuff. No. You know, <laughs> did, I tell, <laughs> did I tell you lastminute.com still 
was shooting videos a week before, panicking as to whether they're going to be edited in time. Just yeah, it sounds did, familiar. No, what, what did I do with that nine months? It's kind of crazy. But the, the other big thing, which you've the problem that you've probably solved now, but I'm used to with Blur having a team. You know, so if we need an album sleeve, we have teams of people that produce great album sleeves. You know, we have uh, yeah, we have sound engineers. You know, that we have lighting people. You know. I starting again from scratch. I had nobody. I, you know, and it, building up that team has been the real challenge. To be honest, out, out of all of it, that's been the hardest thing because mm. you never know if people are going to work until you try them. It's also it's the hardest part. But it's also I, I find it's kind of one of the most satisfying yeah. aspects of it when you get that group of people that you work with and that you collaborate well with. That's as much about finding a, a, my own voice as, say, kind of finding a, 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 a kind of a singing voice or something like that. It's, yeah. That's where you kind of really forge your own identity. And the collaboration for me is what music is all about. I mean, I, mm. interesting though the soundtrack thing is, it does mean spending long, long hours in the studio on my own, you know, kind of that sort of... I just... At the end of these projects, I sometimes think, you know, I've kicked against working in an office all my life. Haven't I just built myself an office here? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm staring, basically staring at a computer screen in this office I've constructed for myself, you know, for months on end. So when I do those, I do try to work with as many other musicians as possible. And I have a, yeah. a good friend that I often collaborate with who's also a composer. And we share the load between us and kind of bounce our ideas off each other. And that works really well. But yeah, music for me is about, it is the interpersonal thing that's the most interesting, the most satisfying, the most fun, really. Getting that team, finding people that I, you know, I work really well with and uh, I have fun working with and we come up with great ideas together with. That, that is, fundamentally, that is what it's all about these days. It used to, I'm sure it used to be about other things, you know, girls and kind of drinking or something. But these days it's just about... Having fun, meeting interesting, creative people, having fun and kind of producing good work, really. Yeah. If that's the most middle-aged thing I've ever said, then I don't apologise. I don't apologise <laughs> because I am middle-aged. Em embrace it, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> that is the kind of thing I could imagine my dad saying. How nice to speak to you. You too, as well. And, um Yeah. Good luck with radio songs. Thank you very much. Good luck with your tour. Thank you very much. Are you playing anywhere near my neck of the woods? I'm near Guildford. Playing at the Boiler Room next Friday, actually. I'm there. Right. Perfect. Oh, fantastic. OK, <laughs> good. So we will continue this conversation next week. <laughs> OK, perfect. Thanks for listening to the TalkHouse podcast, and thanks to Dave Roundtree and Philip Selway for chatting. If you liked what you heard, please follow TalkHouse on your favorite podcasting platform and check out all we've got to offer at TalkHouse.com. This episode was produced by Myron Kaplan and the TalkHouse theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time.